I'm Sandy Peterson, and we're going to talk about what a real kaiju could be like. Now, for those of you not up on the jargon, kaiju is simply a Japanese term that we, means monster. Sometimes it is called dai kaiju because dai means big. So dai kaiju is a big monster, and it has been used over the years to apply to the multiplicity of giant monsters that the Japanese have attacking their cities and other places in the world since the 50s. So the Japanese didn't start it. We've been fascinated by giant monsters since the dawn of film. We had Gertie the Dinosaur in 1914, in which the guy that talked about Gertie actually climbs into the screen to ride off on him. We have King Kong from 1933. So giant monsters are really interesting. We like them, and we always want to, you know, see stuff with them. Now, they kept getting bigger. Gertie the Dinosaur was a dinosaur. King Kong was from 24 to 36 feet high, depending on which scene he was in, in 1933. Godzilla was a couple hundred feet tall, and uh, and Lord knows how big Cloverfield monster was. But let's go into this in some detail. Now, one of the most common thing that spoil sports will tell us is, you can't have giant monsters because of the square cube law. This means that we can't have a real Godzilla, we can't have an elephant-sized ant, Basically, these guys have been trying to pee in our Cheerios for decades, saying you can't have what you want, which is giant monsters. But are they wrong? Kind of. When I was a kid, I was fascinated with dinosaurs. I remember reading that the brontosaurs and the brachiosaurs were so big, they couldn't have supported their weight on land, and they would have had to stay in water to keep, to keep alive from crushing them under their own weight. Now, this was proven dumb for a couple reasons. One is, how can they lay eggs in the water? The second is, if their bodies were that far underwater, they couldn't actually breathe because of the weight of the water would crush their lungs. But they basically proved that, that the giant sauropods lived on land. They might have gone in water once in a while like elephants do, but they were terrestrial. But even more to the point, I learned that Pteranodon was the biggest possible flying animal. It could barely fly. It was so big. A 27-foot wingspan, a body almost the size of a man's. Nothing could be bigger than it. That was the limit that we had. Then we discovered the bones of Asdarchans. Look at these things. It's taller than a giraffe. It has a 40-foot wingspan, and its body is proportionally bigger than a pteranodon's to its body. Its head is longer than I am. So perhaps the limits that people put on giant things isn't always real. They used to think that insects could, could only be a certain size. They found arthropods from the Carboniferous that were seven or eight feet long that lived on land. Millipede-like things or centipede-like things. So nature could find a way, but let us posit how a genuine kaiju could live hundreds of feet high or more and not violate the square cube law at all. Well, one obvious way is you could have giant aliens that float, like in this image, but that's not really very satisfying. What we want is a giant alien that stomps our cities. Now, I've talked earlier about how Cthulhu could be gigantic and not violate square cube, but Cthulhu is made of exotic matter. He's weird. He might have negative mass. He might have uh, muons. Who knows what he has? He's not like us. We want something that obeys our natural laws, that is made of regular matter, you know, our elements that we know from a periodic table with neutrons and, and atoms and that kind of thing. And so let's assume our, our kaiju is made of th these things normal elements with chemical bonds and so forth. So how can we get giant monsters? Well, chordates, like us, humans, our bones are made of calcium, phosphate, and protein. They're pretty strong. In fact, they're remarkably strong, but they're not really designed for super gigantic size. Arthropods, for their skeletons, use chitin. That's a kind of polysaccharide. Larger Arthropods, like crabs, mineralize this with calcium, but it's still not enough to get to the size of a skyscraper. So, how can we get to the size of a skyscraper? Well, let me make one thing clear. We can build skyscrapers. Therefore, there are materials that can be strong enough to make something the size of a skyscraper. Duh! There's no inherent reason that if we can make a building a half mile tall, 
that we couldn't make a creature a half mile tall. Now, it would have to have structural supports that weren't calcium phosphate, like our bones, with steel, and we've worked this out, we could in theory build buildings a mile high. We haven't done it because like, it's technologically difficult, but it's possible. Now, of course, our imaginary kaiju has to do more than just stand there like a building. It has to move around. It's probably easier to imagine a tree a mile high if it had mineralized supports than it is a creature. But consider exotic biologies. We're made of a lot of elements. While almost all of us is carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, <clears throat> there are other elements involved. We have cobalt in us, we have silicon, we have vanadium, we even have zinc. There's not much, but a little of all that. If we posit a creature from an environment that is vastly different from ours, it is possible to imagine a greater reliance on heavy metals and less reliance on non-metals. Picture a titan whose bones, instead of being calcium phosphate, are deposited from titanium or cobalt or made of alloys of tungsten and steel. This isn't impossible. Okay, we have, we have iron in our blood. You could deposit a bone out of iron. Now, instead of muscles that are made of protein and water, which is what ours are, what if it used the explosive power of, say, cesium or diethyl zinc? Okay, there's no reason that this is energy sources that, it, that a thing could use. Because we're also positing extreme strength for this thing, there's no reason that it couldn't have scales or a shell made of molybdenum or nickel or chromium to observe to endure extreme conditions this would be a very different creature from what we have on earth okay this would be a very alien chemistry plus the fact that it has so many heavy metals would probably mean it's highly radioactive radiation to us is harmful it breaks up our dna what if these things didn't use dna for genetic coding but something else what if they used gamma rays atomic power instead of solar power. Metal compounds that make energy when they're hit by hard radiation. That's not hard to imagine. We can produce energy from hard radiation. We do it in atomic piles and atomic weapons. Anything could therefore produce that energy. So we're positing our creature that uses heavy metals in its makeup, that uses something more durable than DNA to for genetic code or has better fixing systems for correcting the code, all right? Uh, what disadvantages would such a thing have? Well, you may not realize this, but vertebrates, us, humans, fish, dogs, we, our skeletons made of calcium phosphate, take a long time to deposit compared to animals that don't have a skeleton. Let me give you an example. The giant squid lives in the deep sea. It's huge. It only takes three years to reach full size, we think. Okay, now an animal without a skeleton simply grows faster. Uh, let's compare. Now, the giant squid lives in the deep, deep sea, about the same area as the orange roofy fish. The orange roofy fish takes about 20 years to get to maturity, and it gets about this big. The squid, which takes, about this, which takes three years to get to maturity, is thousands of pounds. Why is the orange roofy so small? Part of it is because it has bones. Our giant alien creatures, have to deposit chromium and vanadium and aluminum and Lord knows what, titanium in their bones, this would probably take a long time. They would probably have an even more catastrophically slow lifespan than vertebrates, okay? It might take them centuries to grow to full size. So if it takes them so long to grow, like why would they even do this? Well, one reason is that once they become mature adults, they're really, really durable. They could last for thousands or tens of thousands of years. With that lifespan, even if they breed once a decade, that's gonna produce plenty of kids over the creature's lifespan. And consider this, imagine this world with these slow growing atomic based creatures, okay? it would evolve naturally towards making ever bigger creatures. The bigger creatures can more easily spare some other substance to make babies, and they can eat the smaller ones to restore the metal they lost. Plus, they themselves are harder to eat, so they're more survivable. Evolution would push towards bigger and bigger things under this regime. Everything would have to be the biggest possible, okay? Now, I'm gonna posit that these aliens would be intelligent. 
not only because it's fun, but because they would have really big brains. If you're 300 feet tall, your brain by necessity is going to be big. They wouldn't think like us, but why wouldn't they be able to? They're huge, they're nearly indestructible, and they're smart enough to know that their breeding uses up heavy metals from the planet's crust. Even if their planet has a lot more heavy metals than ours, which I'm sure it does, it still gets used up over time. To get more minerals, they have to either eat each other or they have to travel to another planet. Fortunately for them, although they're huge, which makes it harder to travel, they they also don't need much of a spacesuit. Their outer armor and toughness might help them survive even in a vacuum. I doubt they'd use oxygen to breathe as a catalyst. They, I'm sure they would use liquid or crystalline catalysts for their metabolism. So we're already imagining that they construct their colossal bodies with metal. Let's not stop there. What energy source do they need to keep going? Can they consume enough protein to survive? Why would they even want protein? Their body's not made of protein. What do they use to move and activate themselves? Muscle power wouldn't be enough. Well, I hinted before, what they need is atomic power, radioactive elements. They would probably seek out deposits of uranium or pitch blend and ores like that. By the way, radioactive ores aren't rare, okay? In our Earth's crust, uranium is dozens of times more common than silver or gold. It's easy to find. In a heavy metal world, it's probably even more so. In positing these aliens, let's zero on a single one and talk about it. And I've given these aliens a name like I have for the other aliens I've talked about, the Urumak. Now, how can they survive being radioactive? Well, they don't have DNA to take damage from it. And uh, while being radioactive has other effects, if their body is designed to use nuclear fission or fusion to give them energy and help them metabolize, they are literally atom-powered monsters. This is an extreme level of imagination, but the universe is really big. Why do we have to imagine that everything is made of carbon jelly like us? There could be a lot of different ways of life out there. If they use nuclear power for energy, they don't actually need to eat people. Though they might want to eat a city for the structural matter. They might want the silicon, they might want the iron. They also need radioactive substance. They'd probably be attracted to atomic plants. They can chemically strain radioactive elements from metal ores, and thus they might be gathering radium or thorium or something. But if they found a really good source with a lot of radioactive in one place, like a bomb, I mean, these things would love to go eat a bunch of ICBMs. Okay, now, can we nuke them? Sure. What would happen? So let's posit what nuking one of these things would do. Well, any radiation from the nuke would be good for them. They probably like that. They wouldn't mind that at all. The heat and force from the blast would not be good for them. But a nuclear blast, though it's powerful, is not as terrifying as we've necessarily been led to believe. It's not that hard to make a building, a structure, that will survive a nuclear blast. Surviving the aftermath of the nuclear blast is another issue, right? Now, our monsters, made partly of metal, would doubtless see part of their body melt off. They themselves might be tumbled hundreds of yards away. But the US Navy did a bunch of tests on ships of war after World War II, basically taking old battleships, some of them, you know, and they'd put them out at sea, and they'd drop a nuke on them to see what happened. It turns out ships are really hard to sink with a nuke, especially battleships. Well, our monsters are essentially living battleships. So they also would be tough, tougher to stop. Now, if we did manage to kill one of them with a nuke, that would probably attract other Uramak to the area because they'd want to feed off the radioactive particles in the air. In fact, they might be good at cleaning up radiation. They also want to eat the metal remains of the dead Uramak. You got to recycle us up. Nothing has to go to waste, right? So these would be pretty fearsome opponents. They're incredibly hard to destroy. They're radioactive, titanically huge. They would have different sizes depending on where you met them in their life cycle. Now. Remember, I'm not positing that they're fully made of metal. I'm saying they have metal components. I don't know how much it would be. They may have part protein muscles, but also with titanium cables running through it, for example. Now remember, one of the things is I said they could live in space. If they can hibernate, if they can turn off their atomic generator, they could last a long time in a state of, of hibernation. That might be useful on their planet when they can't find any food. No doubt for travel or prolonged hibernating periods, they need some kind of protective carapace or shield. So here's an image of one covered with such a carapace made of crystalline structures. Now, they have other weaknesses. 
For one thing, they aren't stealthy. You always see one of these things coming. Another weakness is they're not very common in number. If it takes a thousand years to grow up, they don't recover from defeats too fast. They'd probably be obsessed with their complex life cycles and gathering resources. You might be able to buy them off. I can easily imagine some kaiju coming to Earth and then President Trump and President Putin and Xi Jinping offering the kaiju, hey, here's a few hundred tons of plutonium, Go, don't come back for 300 years, and then having them leave. It'd probably be worth it. If we did have to fight them, how would such an atomic power, metal-clad thing battle? They do have an atomic reactor in their body perhaps more than one. They could presumably tap this for an energy source emitting plasma or particles. In other words, atomic breath of a sort. Of course, they could just build weapons. They're intelligent, they know how to do it. They may also build weapons that enhance or focus their natural ability instead of just making their own weapon. So my Uramak that I come up with, what I've posited here is a huge, nearly indestructible Titan who is radioactive and has atomic death rays. But this comes as a result of logic. If you say, I want to have a thing that's as big as a building, therefore it has to have metal parts to get that big. Therefore it has to be able to fuel itself. It has to live so slowly. It probably uses atomic power. All this comes naturally together. It's not just me making up something. But isn't a giant radioactive monster with atomic death what we kind of want to meet when we go to outer space? I know I do.